And another aspect of the, this uh, responding to the gray zone challenges in the, the Pacific region uh, is actually in probably the, the fundamental thing that we can do, the Americans can do, is actually to uh, better align with the Japanese. In, in simple words, become a real ally with them. Try to have the relationship with the Japanese that we had with the British. Uh, back before the British decided they didn't want a military. Uh, but it really has to be a relationship of equals. It has to be a m and that has been one of the fundamental problems of the relationship uh, for decades, is that it really was so out of whack, so imbalanced, uh, that it really threatened the, the stability of the relationship, certainly the political stability, uh, where the United States was effectively making most of the contributions to the defense relationship, while the Japanese made almost none, just providing some real estate and really a pittance financially. But once you more equalize the relationship, uh, the, that suddenly has a, a dynamic, it changes the dynamic in Northeast Asia, and I would suggest throughout Asia. Uh, with Before that, it was very easy actually to split the relationship, if necessary, because uh, we were not really tied together, except for the two navies, but otherwise it was very operating in parallel. Uh, but once you actually create a more useful Japanese, more capable Japanese military and align it with the Americans, that it, it, so it has a, both an operational effect and also a political effect uh, in the region. And the knock-on effect goes beyond Northeast Asia. Now, there's a number of other countries in Asia that are looking to they see what the U.S. and Japan are doing and whether or not they need to hedge their, hedge their bets. Uh, and that's... Uh, uh, so it's just the, from an adversary's perspective, uh, linked up U.S.-Japan relationship, able to fight together uh, effectively, is a very difficult uh, uh, challenge. Uh, additionally, one wants to, of course, look beyond just the U.S.-Japan relationship and also consider uh, the, rest of the, the rest of the region. In other words, look at the whole map. Uh, consider, for example, Taiwan. You know, is it you know, enforcing the Taiwan, or just living up to the terms of the Taiwan Relations Act? for example, could go a long way. Uh, it's, living, it's a priceless evidence that 28 million Han Chinese can, uh, can govern themselves democratically with a consensual government, uh, can handle uh, individual liberties. Uh, so to belies the, the argument that the Chinese need to be repressed in order to have stability. Taiwan is living proof that that, that is, uh, is not the case. And, and also you d looking beyond just uh, Taiwan, you look at the rest of the region, which is very, it's very interested in becoming, it's, uh, in fact, very concerned about how much it can rely on the United States presence. Uh, the the U.S.-Japan relationship tying up actually encourages them and makes them less nervous and less uh, likely to try and hedge their bets. Um, but you find that the more successful you are uh, with the U.S.-Japan uh, military relationship, which leads to a good, better political relationship, you'll find that other countries are more willing to join in and become uh, partners. And, and that's something which I think bodes well for, for regional stability. But it is important, obviously, to look beyond the map. Um, it's also worth considering uh, the idea of trying to create an environment that is uh, where, where you've got a s secure uh, sort of architecture for uh, that the U.S. can use to support, defend its core interests. And we do need to be clear about our own core interests. Um, and that is where this relationship with Japan is important, where these uh, bases or places we have access to are important, and this network of relationships we have in the region create this fundamental uh, architecture uh, that, that's very important. Um, you know, beyond just the, the idea of trying to respond to particular incidents, if you're just responding to incidents, you probably fail because uh, you're in a completely reactive mode. But also, you're um, if, if you're just in, say, responding, you uh, you'd never be able to gauge the right amount of force needed to cause someone to behave in a certain way. That has never worked. It's hard to do, and Americans aren't very good at it. If anyone is, it's uh, look at McNamara in Vietnam, just a classic example of how that. Uh, sort of this idea that you can somehow come up with this graduated response to specific incidents and get people to do just what you want them to do. It doesn't work very well. It didn't work very well in Afghanistan at the beginning when the Americans tried to bomb the Taliban just enough so that they wouldn't attack, uh, that the Northern Alliance would not take Kabul and they would just negotiate. Uh, it didn't work very well. Once they went to the B-52s on a more consistent basis, that worked much better.